Hey, well, what's up, everyone? Welcome to The Collision. Daniel here, and I am very excited today to be joined by a special, special guest, Mr. John Scanlon, the producer of the new film Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Spy, Assassin, uh, releasing through Angel Studios on November 22nd. Uh, thanks so much, John, for stopping by and just talking about this movie. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate being here. Yeah, and I should say right off the start, uh, just congratulations, because this is a great film. I've had the chance to to watch this film, and I, I really enjoyed it. I think a lot of people are really going to just appreciate all that you accomplished in this film. Uh, but why don't we start at, go back, start at the beginning, because I think this has been a, a long process for you. Uh, this is the, the culmination, I think, of a, a, a long journey that, yes. um, you know, to get this from idea stage up to on the uh, theaters on November 22nd. Yep. Uh, so how did you first become involved in this movie? And perhaps kind of what about, you know, what attracted you just to the story of Bonhoeffer? Sure. Um, I think anybody who's read Bonhoeffer's writings or, or uh, biographies of Bonhoeffer is inspired by his story. Uh, he's just a, um, a man very much of his time, but someone who really uh, just committed to faith in action, committed to living out his faith. He was a passionate follower of Jesus. Uh, he had a wonderful encounter with Jesus and with faith in action in Harlem in the United States, which is one of the focal points of our film. And I think maybe a, an under, under, underrepresented, underknown aspect of his story. And then comes back to Germany in the middle of World War II and realizes that there are lessons he's learned and thinks he can apply from that experience to his witness in, uh, in Germany as, it, uh, as it's engulfed in Nazism in the war. So it, it's, a, it's an exciting story. It's a story where the stakes couldn't be higher. And, uh, and I think we've translated it on screen into a very exciting, very kind of cinematic version of his life. Yeah, and he's, he's definitely a... I think a, a very fascinating individual. Uh, he's also just a complicated one. I don't know many historical figures that will have the words, you know, pastor and assassin, both in the title of their biopic. Yeah. There's just a lot going on that is very unique to just to the life that uh, he lived. Kind of as a producer, as someone sort of shepherding this project, mm -hmm. were there any challenges in that, in kind of, you know, telling a story of, you know, some very complex, just moral, maybe gray areas or questions? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What were some of those that you kind of that you came up against? Yeah. Well, it's so I'll just I'll just pick a um, a kind of storytelling one to begin with. You know, in in cinema, the heart of any uh, drama is conflict. You know, two people want different things. They fight. One wins. It's that sort of thing. Um, and it's true in the lives of believers as well. You know, we all grow through overcoming challenges, through meeting challenges that we think are uh, impossible obstacles, and then God finds a way around. Um, this, the problem with uh, a figure like Bonhoeffer uh, in, and perhaps some other um, believers about whom films have been made is it, it, you're, you're tempted to make it a hagiography, just a sort of saint story where everything works out perfectly. They're great people at the beginning of the story. They triumph over adversity. They're great people at the end. And Bonhoeffer is a cinema character par excellence in the sense that he grows. He adapts. He overcomes. He's always on the move. He's always confronting challenges. And bringing his A game, no matter what you know, no matter how big the giant, but uh, but he does grow, and he and he does adapt, and he does overcome. So, just in in from a storytelling perspective, the cinema version of Bonhoeffer that we're presenting is a very exciting kind of film character. And of course, the um, uh, you know the film itself and 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 the elements and the events we try to weave into the story. Most of the characters are real people um, drawn from history, and there's a lot of source material about them and about Bonhoeffer. Uh, so the idea was to try to, to try to create a, a cinematic portrayal that was both entertaining, uh, true, beautiful and good, and also just excellent art, which I think this film really is. And some of the obstacles, the biggest obstacles around the film, to be honest, were coming up with the right way to tell the story so that it didn't come off as dry and academic. It didn't come off as, uh, you know, Bonhoeffer was a saint and, uh, really didn't live that interesting a life because he... He never had to overcome any obstacles and never changed. Um, and just telling a story that, you know, that really worked on screen. We went through several different teams of screenwriters over the years. Uh, we met with several different potential distribution partners. We dodged a lot of bullets. Uh, there were relationships that we could have entered into that in retrospect, it's a good thing we didn't. Um, we almost started production right before COVID, uh, which would have been a disaster for us. So the timing, although it's been a long journey, has really worked out 
to our favor and, and we see God's hand behind everything that's happened around this project, to be honest. Yeah, I think one of the things in this film that, that makes Bonhoeffer such a compelling, like you said, a cinematic uh, character, is that like internal conflict. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, the the assassination plot on Hitler is probably the, the flashiest. Those that don't know much about Bonhoeffer, that's, you know, hey, is, that's what they're expecting to see. Where really, at least to me, the core of this film is more about his personal faith. This is his, yes. his, his convictions. I think and just the courage to stand for, you know, what he believes uh, to be true. Yeah. Uh, maybe as someone that says you've spent a lot of time with, you know, researching just with this character making the film. Yeah. How would you describe Bonhoeffer's faith and I don't know if there's anything while making the film that you learned about Bonhoeffer that just yeah. stood out or inspired you. He's 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 very he was very uh, rigorous and academic about his faith in the beginning. Um, he was a uh, uh, you know became a theologian, a credentialed theologian at a very young age. Um, was a bit of a black sheep in his family for wanting to go into the church, but committed to that, stuck to it. Uh, wound up in in um, in New York City at Union Theological Seminary. Uh, in Manhattan as a, a very young scholar, sort of a, a star representative of the German church. Um, and as you'll see in the film, he uh, falls in with a different kind of crowd, a crowd that um, may not be as, uh, as theologically schooled as he is, but has a different connection with Jesus that, that really calls to him and really draws him in. And it's that that really lights a fire under his face and sends him back to Germany with kind of a mission um, and I, I don't want to—I don't want to spoil, spoil the film or give it away anything. But uh, but I think what you see in the film is someone who's passionately committed to following Jesus, and who finds his path toward him through whatever circumstances are in his way. He's always listening. He's always attentive. He's unforgiving of himself. Uh, he's very self-disciplined and and uh, radical in his commitment to discipleship and to faith. Um, and that costs him because he sees those things being attacked and undermined in. The Germany of his day. Uh, so there's a lot of heartbreak for him along the way and a lot of uh, disappointment and reversal, but ultimately there's triumph. Yeah, and you mentioned like the, the, those experiences in Harlem that kind of shaped his faith. I know that was a new part. I didn't really know that part of his story. And yeah. probably one of my favorite scenes in this whole film is in the in the club hearing jazz music for the first time and uh, just doing it seems like such a small part uh, to the film but yeah. you realize just how much how influential just that experience so those early years uh, were for his life i think another thing that works uh, worked very well for me in this film is that it is a gorgeous film uh, this film yes. looks uh, spectacular i think it, it definitely helps to have uh, someone I know you had like john uh, matheson was the cinematographer for this film That's and i know you filmed on location i believe um the ones i uh, found belgium and ireland i don't know if there's anywhere else yeah. um, maybe speak to a bit about that just sort of like how much of a priority was it to you know really try and capture authentically you know just that the look and the the atmosphere of that time period oh it was uh it was absolutely essential we felt um to the point where uh, sort of at every level the film was uh what it, we we worked in elements of uh commitment to the period commitment to the uh types of actors that would that would come across as most authentic and by the way if i could just give a couple more shout outs you've named john matheson who was the uh cinematographer on the first gladiator with ridley scott and worked on a number of other ridley scott films actually left our set the day we wrapped to go to the set of Gladiator 2, oh, so, which is wow. also opening on November 22nd. So John's going to have a good weekend with two of his <laughs> films in, uh, in theaters. Um, but John Beard, our set designer, just unbelievably meticulous, found period pieces and things to, to create 360-degree uh, panoramas where the actors could just immerse themselves. Even at times when the camera wasn't on something, they could see it, and it would, it would feed into that. Um, uh, uh, Todd Komernicki is our unbelievably talented uh, writer director. Um, so great at, uh, at at picking and coaching people, and kind of working them into this dynamic of let's recreate Harlem, let's recreate Germany uh, on set and on screen. And to that end, you'll find most of the actors in the film uh, that are playing uh, uh, anti-Nazi Germans are actually German. Um, so they're you know, people with a deep sense of connectedness and history to this story. And then uh, just one more anecdote, um, our costume designer, uh, you see a couple of scenes. There's one where Hitler's pulling up to a museum and he gets out of his staff car and there are soldiers in different kinds of uniforms, you know, sort of lining the, the walkway there. 
And you might think, well, why, why are they wearing different kinds of uniforms? The fact is our customer, our costume designer, actually went and researched, you know, what year is it? What time of year is it? What is this branch of the military wearing then? And what is this other branch wearing? And made sure that everybody was wearing not sort of stock Nazi uniforms, but actual uh, period authentic Nazi uniforms for that time, for that branch of the service. So everything about it was uh, just down to the last detail. And I, there were um, moments where we were sitting on set in Ireland and Belgium, and we're watching the daily, uh, watching the the, the uh, scene actually being shot on these little monitors, and it, it was just magical. I mean, there were moments when you would just look at it and think, "Well, it looks like a Vermeer painting. It looks like a Dutch master. The way it's lit, the way it's, uh, the way everybody's sort of posed and articulated." And that is one of the things about this film that I I think is is really different and special and that is the beauty the level of art that was brought to this by everybody from uh you know our writer director todd kermanicki on down everybody's killing it and bringing their a-game and the acting is phenomenal the music's amazing i mean it's just a it's a very high level film especially given the the subject matter so yeah, yeah and you can, even as a viewer that doesn't know all the behind the scenes going on, you you can feel the attention to detail in yeah. this oh, uh, in this film. Absolutely, um, I mean, uh, what, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, is, was was there any specific? Uh, I'm assuming you were on set in both of those. Uh, yes. Okay. Was there a specific uh, the filming of, of a certain scene or just you know the location to go to that really stands out as being memorable for you? You know, I, the, the scene that comes to mind for both. Uh, uh, good and ill is the scene that we shot in a church in Ireland um, where Bonhoeffer is giving one of his great sermons. Um, in, in fact, sort of the, in some ways, sort of the hinge of the film. Um, and you don't think of sermons as necessarily being all that exciting. This one is really, really inspiring. And to be there, I mean, the, 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 to lead with the bad news, it was unbelievably cold. I was, uh, my wife has a picture of me um, huddled under everything, all the clothes I had on set. And I, I'm, my face is peeking out and everything else is covered. Um, the poor extras uh, who had to sit through this sermon as the uh, congregation and pews are all wearing 1930s street clothes with layers of thermal underwear underneath so that they didn't get hypothermia. Um, but we had Todd in the, in the pulpit and uh, he's, you know, just absolutely doing an amazing, mesmerizing job. And uh, when he got through the first iteration of the sort of the key part of the sermon, uh, everyone on the set, all of the extras, the cameramen, the lighting, the, all of us behind the scenes, just just gave him an ovation. It was irresistible. It was this, this magical moment where... I think everyone at that moment sort of got what this film was about and got the level on which it was operating. And was just like, it was an ovation of, Jonas, that was an amazing performance, but also an ovation of, we're so glad to be here and be a part of this. Just a tremendous, a tremendous moment. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great scene in the movie as well. Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah. You, you feel the power of that, yeah. um, of that scene. Yeah. Uh, this is a movie that is, is set in a historical uh, period, but it is releasing in the year uh, 2024. And in many aspects, like, there are things in this story that, that I think will resonate, will reflect things that uh, we're here talked about experience today, whether that's the threat of you know, nationalism in the church or political violence or charismatic leaders or a lot of the same you know, different contexts, but just a lot of uh, similarities. Um, as a producer of this movie, in what ways do you think that this film, and maybe just Bonhoeffer's life um, in general, can maybe speak to audiences today and you know, will resonate with people? Yeah. Well, I, I want to start off by saying we did not set out to make a message movie. Uh, it was uh, 2012, 2013 when we kind of kicked things off. Um, we had we, we thought at the time that we'd wrap in a couple of years and this film would be in theaters in 2014, 2015. Uh, and every year along the way, we thought, well, next year would be the year we come out. Um, it, it's really the Lord's timing that's coming out this year. Uh, so nothing about our film is designed to send a message. Um, but I think every film, if it's timeless, and I think this one is, is a film both about its own era and a film about the era that it's that it's seen in, and there is a there is a, a a sort of eternal struggle taking place on screen here, where you have a man of faith who's totally committed to the Lord, totally living out of his heart for Jesus, 
but sees himself confronted with impossible choices and has to struggle to overcome those. Um, and some of those are political, some of those are personal, uh, some of those are cultural. And I do think there's an aspect of what do we as Christians do in living out our faith in this world and these very trying circumstances, uh, domestically and internationally in, in political terms. Um, I think we can find a voice and a vision and a, uh, and a role model, really, in the Bonhoeffer film. But again, that's that that was never our intention. We didn't make this film as a tutorial on how to, you know, sort of survive tumultuous political times. But I do think that you'll come out of the theater m m entertained, inspired, maybe with another dimension uh, or a different way of thinking about, you know, how you engage with politics and, and the culture in our time. Um, I do think there's plenty of meat there for for anybody who's serious about engaging. Yeah, it's definitely, I think, a timely film, maybe a timeless uh, film. And I think a lot of people are going to enjoy this. Uh, so thank you so much, John. I know um, this is going to be a busy stretch, the lead up to this uh, film. Uh, but I know that's going to be an exciting time when, when people are um, you know, able to finally start checking out after all these years uh, with the story. I encourage you guys, if you're watching, uh, this film hits uh, theaters November 22nd, and it's fantastic. So go see it on opening weekend. Uh, but thank you so much, John. It was just a pleasure. I know there's I could pick your brain all day. Uh, but thanks so much for just giving a little bit of time to share just your passion for this project. Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate the time.